So, how did I go from a cellular, lumpy lovableness <laughs> to a scientist? Began with this. For the younger folks in the audience, this is the old school version of this. I was 10 years old. I desperately wanted this game. My parents finally let me buy it. The problem is, it chewed through those square, those nine volt batteries. They weren't very efficient back then. So I did what I thought was a bright idea. Went down to the basement, I found an old lamp, I cut off the cable, I opened the back, you know where this is going, I opened the back of the video game, the black and red wire, I tied it together, plugged it into the wall, best 10 seconds of my life. I remember it like it was yesterday. I thought I was going to play before school, after school, 11 seconds, poof. My game, my precious game blew up. The outlet charred. My Trinidadian father comes barreling down the stairs. Son, what are you doing? You're trying to burn down the house. I'm like, no, dad, no. But for me, that single moment was my aha moment. The light bulb went on when I realized this thing called electricity that we took for granted by flicking on a switch or plugging something in the outlet is way more special, way more interesting, way more magical. And that got me hooked on science. Now, I want to take you all way back. This is where we used to be. So now I'd like to ask you some questions. How many of you have texted today? Show of hands. All right, all of you. How many of you had a prescription from the doctor in the last four years? All right, how many of you eat food? And how many of you are sitting in this building? So it sounds funny, but it's really to underscore that today, we absolutely are living in a science and technology replete society. If you don't think that's true, see if you can wake up tomorrow morning and get throughout the day without specifically being impacted by science and technology. The food we eat, unless you shop religiously at Trader Joe's or Whole Food, has been genetically modified. Until now, you haven't worried about the massive amount of concrete and steel that's above us coming crashing down to kill us. You don't worry about that. You don't worry about that because scientists and engineers have spent a lot of time thinking about the math and physics and mechanics to make it safe. So how about this? Every minute, 4 million Google searches. Every minute, 2.5 million bits of information are shared on Facebook. And my favorite, all of us in this room on average check our smart devices 150 times a day. And for those of you who have children, age roughly 9 to 15, whenever you decide to give them a smart device, multiply that number by 3. So we really are in a science and technology society. So what about jobs? We're all interested in that. Well, the job market is really exciting. All kinds of studies talk about, both in America and around the Western world, 50% of the jobs by the year of 2020, half of the jobs will be specifically dependent on science, technology, engineering, and math. And I'm not talking about getting a PhD, folks. I'm talking about going to a community college and getting a two-year technical degree, and you can start at fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 a year. So if science is everywhere, technology is helping us, and there are lots of job opportunities, what's the problem? Well, despite that, the problem is we are living in a rapidly growing science illiterate society, and this is bad. Lots of studies, government studies, non-for-profit institutions, including the National Science Foundation for the last two decades, have looked at the science literate level of this great nation. And guess what? Nobody in this room but one quarter of all Americans still think that the sun revolves around the earth. It's true. Dinosaurs, almost 50% of people, 41% of Americans believe that dinosaurs and humans coexisted. Now this I get. I'm a 70s, 80s kid. I remember Fred got on the back of a dinosaur and was mining rocks. Fair enough. Let's talk about GMOs. We all hear about GMOs and synthetic biology in the news, right? And people are not sure, should they trust this? Oh my gosh, what's happening? Well, let me pause and just let you know that whether you believe in God, Yahweh, Allah, practice Buddhism, or you're a Big Bang theorist, Mother Nature, ladies and gentlemen, has genetically modified organisms since the beginning of Mother Nature. <laughs> Farmers have been doing it for thousands of years. All scientists are doing are figuring out the molecular biology and the biochemistry behind it to better understand it and sometimes accelerate the process. And if you think, well, you're messing around with nature, we shouldn't do that, fair enough, that's an idea, that's an opinion, but how about how we use water? 
Should we not leverage what scientists, engineers, and technologists have given us? Clean water, being able to be hygienic, watering our crops? Or should we wait in the morning for it to rain so we can go to work clean and have our children bathe? No, sometimes accelerating nature can be helpful. Here's some information on climate change, a fun little comic. We're better here in this country. About 70% of Americans do believe there is this thing called climate change, but half don't think humans have anything to do with it. In fact, just recently, the largest body of researchers around the world looking at this stuff talk about in the next 15 years, we have to cut our carbon emissions by 50% and then by 100% 15 years later to have a chance at saving our great planet. Vaccines, this is near and dear to my heart. As an immunologist, I've lived all around the world, some interesting places, doing a lot of work around vaccines. And let me just level set so we're on the same page. Every year, 2.5 million lives are saved through vaccines. And since Jenner and the onset of vaccination and immunizations, over 500 million lives have been saved. Over half a billion. Despite that, in this country and elsewhere around the world, kids still die because of measles because their parents elect not to vaccinate them from a protective vaccine. Some of my favorite are these images. Who can identify the bacteria versus the viruses in this picture? All right? I don't know if this has happened to you, but it's definitely happened to me where you've gone to the doctor and they said, hey, Frederick, um, I think you have a viral infection. I'm like, bummer. And then what do they do? They write your prescription for antibiotic. If that should happen to you, this is what you do. Take the prescription, slide it right back. You don't need to have a PhD in pharmacology to know and understand that antibiotics are antibacterial and have no effect on viruses. If you took antibiotics and you had a viral infection and you got better, that's a coincidence. <laughs> what... <clears throat> Some other associated issues with science literacy. Some of my favorite are, despite the fact that our great world and society depends on science and technology, if I asked you to think of a scientist or name me three scientists, who's the first name we come up with? This is not a magic show, folks. Albert Einstein. And if I ask for a female scientist, who do we say? This is not a trick show. And if it's Black History Month and I ask you to name me a scientist, you guys are like, there's that peanut guy, George Washington Carver. Now... I, like many TED Talk personnel earlier, really understand the importance of history and we need to celebrate these great figures. But if you're trying to motivate the next generation of world changers through science and tech, it's hard to do with folks who are deceased. So if I stretch you all as an audience, work with me. If I say, name me a living scientist, who do you shout out? <laughs> all right, we got an intellectual crowd here. I'm liking it. <laughs> nice. Now, if I push you a little further and say, name me a second one, who do you get? <laughs> right? All right? Now, um, Bill Nye the science guy, guess what? He's not even a scientist, he's an engineer. But that matters to nobody except for scientists and engineers. All right, so um, are they solutions? The good news is there are some solutions and I wanna run through real quickly three of them. One is we really have to change how we think of our school system. We have to evolve education. Here's a photograph of the first public school in this country called Boston Land. This picture was taken in the 1820s. And what do you notice? Deaths in rows, all boys, etc. They had these two individuals in the back. They were like wizards. They had all this information. They'd give it to you and you'd write it down and then you'd memorize it over a period of two weeks and you'd do this thing called a test and you'd vomit it all back. You'd regurgitate it back, right? Well, that was important 200 years ago. That's how you transferred information. Someone had it and they told it to you and you wrote it down and learned it. Well, today with search engines, we can access information instantly, right? So... That doesn't impress you? Well, how many of y'all came to this TED Talk in one of these? <laughs> right? We don't. We've evolved transportation, using planes, trains, automobiles. We've evolved almost everything. But across this great nation, much of our public school system still looks like this. In fact, here's a real picture of a classroom in today's, in today's um, um, spaces. And what do you notice? The kids are gone. Because this is where the average kid is. No fault of their own, they're consumed by the barrage of digital technology coming at them. And so we should take classrooms from this and make them look like this, where the kids are hand-on, engaged, really getting into to learning. Um, and you can even start at the very young. So what's the second big problem? Well, 
this is a call to all my colleagues, my scientists. We need to do a better job of coming out of the hallowed halls of Ivory Tower, coming out the labs, stop being by yourself or hanging with your colleagues, and please, for the love of goodness, stop using a vocabulary that only 10 people around the planet understand. It doesn't make you smarter because people can't translate you. Instead, come out in the public, showcase to Joe and Jane Q public, get them excited, do some outside inspirational science shows, and as a scientist, look deeper. Look at the reactions. <laughs> in fact, even the great mayor of this amazing city sees the value of hands-on exciting science. But near and dear to my heart is please let's celebrate the great men and women who are changing the very world we live in through their discoveries in science and technology. The media can play a great role here. We're looking at Katherine Johnson. She turned 100 years old this past August. She is the one behind Hidden Figures. And the great, the great senator and the greatest astronaut, or one of the greatest astronauts, certainly of this country and of the world, almost 70 years ago, picked her to do the calculus to make sure she, he could orbit the planet and land back on Earth safe. Imagine how many more female mathematicians and engineers, imagine how many more black and brown children we would have in science if they knew that an African-American woman in the 30s was the brains behind successful NASA missions. So last, please, let's bring back common sense. If, if your car breaks down, you're probably going to call a mechanic. If you're mechanically kind, okay, maybe, but for the rest of us, we'll call a mechanic. If your sink is leaking or you're having plumbing issues, we call a plumber, right? If you have heart issues or you need a cardiac thoracic surgeon, fine. So, you know, if you want to learn about GMOs or vaccines or climate change, you can have an opinion, and absolutely, science is about pushing back and being skeptical, but go to the experts who spent decades learning this craft. Because while opinions are great, right? I love opinions, and they're fun, but I don't think any of you all would get on an airplane that's flown by your mother or father or friends who had an opinion about how flight worked. No, <laughs> we will go to pilots who are experts to get us from A to B safely. So with that, Ladies and gentlemen, please understand that science is for everyone. Don't be scared about it. And especially we need to raise the bar around science literacy because as um, De La Soul said in their fourth album, stakes are high. And hopefully you will avoid exploiting your cherished video game. Thank you very much. <laughs>